Welcome to The Thriving Christian Artist, the podcast where we hope you connect with God to bust through the roadblocks that have held you back for years, create the work you love, and really live the life you know God created you to live as an artist in His kingdom. I'm Matt Tommy, your host. Let's get started. Well, hey there, my friend. I'm really glad that you're with me today here on The Thriving Christian Artist podcast. Listen, I don't know if you have these kind of people in your life, but... um. You know, I have people in my life that I, when they speak, I listen. <laughs> and one of those people uh, in my life is a guy named Paul Pruitt. Paul is not only an uber entrepreneur and great business person, but he's also an artist. He's been a, a very successful photographer for a number of years. And uh, after he owned a multi million dollar real estate agency, and is one of these guys that I really love his story because he's living a life of convergence where everything, uh, that God's put in him that he loves is able to come out and flourish in this season of his life. Uh, we've had the great pleasure of being in a mastermind group together for a number of years and, uh, you know, just getting to know each other, getting to know each other's story, encouraging each other. And um, he is one of the speakers this year at our Thriving Christian Artists Conference, which is coming up in May, parentheses. If you've not signed up, you need to click the link <laughs> inside, inside the show notes and be with us. It's going to be really, really awesome. But anyway, Paul is on the podcast today, he's going to be sharing some nuggets from from his journey for you, and uh, and really just giving you a taste of what he's going to be sharing at the Thriving Christian Artist Conference. He and his wife Melissa, who is also an Uber entrepreneur and uh, focuses in the social media realms, uh, especially on Instagram, uh, they're going to be with us. And uh, listen, it's going to be great. So <laughs> this is just a little bit of teaser of great, great things to come. So I hope you'll enjoy today's. Um, today's episode. All right. Well, listen, you know, I love to give a shout out to my listeners uh, as we get the podcast started. And I wanted to, I, I said, you know what? We're always going to iTunes. I'm going to roll on over to Podbean and see what's going on. And lo and behold, tons of people are listening over there. So Joyce Wolman, Joyce, thank you for uh, your comments. I see several that you put in here, but she said, Matt, I love this podcast. So often you put out a podcast with exactly what I need to hear in my creative season. I've learned so much through this about God, myself, creativity, and more. This is a must listen for any creative with questions. God bless. Well, Joyce, thank you so much. And really, from the bottom of my heart, it means the world to me for listeners like you to encourage me. Let me know that you're listening and uh, let me know that what we're doing is is uh, an encouragement to your life. So I'm, I'm so, so glad about that. Listen, if you're listening out there, you've never... Uh, you know, you've never reviewed or subscribed to the podcast, click the button. Hello. <laughs> All you got to do is just scroll down in iTunes. If you're listening on Apple podcasts and, and click write a review or anywhere else, any other, um, you know, software that you're using another app, uh, just click the, the write a review button, click the subscribe button, make sure that you don't miss any of these episodes. All right. Well, Hey, without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way and, uh, give you the opportunity to hear a great friend of mine and a guy that I respect a lot. Mr. Paul Pruitt. Here we go. Well, hey, everybody. I am so excited to have my friend Paul Pruitt on uh, with me. Paul, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, I I appreciate this. We're we're so blessed that uh, that you even thought of Melissa and I, and and for me to be on here today is is just a blessing. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You are uh, one of those people that I really value their opinion. And uh, I've never said that maybe to you, but you are such a wise person and such a breadth of life experience and business experience and marketing. And i um, so excited to talk to you today because uh, not only from the artist perspective, which you are yourself, but you, uh, as a photographer for so many years, but also from the business perspective and helping uh, emerging entrepreneurs uh, really get their feet under them as they develop their brand and that sort of thing. So I don't know where this is going to go today, but we're going to have a great time. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely looking forward to it. <laughs> now, listen, I know that uh, just a little bit of your backstory, you grew up in an artist family. Your dad was an artist. So talk a little bit about that, because I don't know that you consider yourself, quote unquote, an artist per se, but I know that creative side is a big part of who you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to say that art it has manifested in many different ways, mm. uh, the creative side. So from... I grew up with uh, my father having a guitar in his hand almost every single day of my life. And that's, that's the, the reality I saw from him. Now I didn't know until I was older and I understood a little bit more 
uh, that before I was born, uh, so I was born in 73, but in the late 60s, early 70s, he was a lead guitar player for Bill Haley and the Comets. Wow. He'd travel around. He was on TV a couple times. And th they didn't cut anything new, but they went on tours and stuff like that at that time. And uh, so I have a lot of photos uh, and, and different little playbills that, that he was on and everything, which is really, really, really exciting. But, but um, you know, he, that's what he did for a living. So that, wow. that was like his reality. It wasn't a nine to five job. There was always gigs. There was always opportunities. He'd always have to, his last job always was his reputation to getting the next job. Wow. I think as artists, a lot of us, you know, can definitely relate to that. Sure. Um, and of course, I was named after him. I'm Paul Jr. So the, the you can only imagine the disappointment in the family when, <laughs> like, when I got a little older, like when I was seven years old, I, I actually bought a camera and like that was my love and I had no interest in picking up a guitar. Everybody's like, they just had all the eyes on me like I was going to be like the next big thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've already let you down right no pressure exactly. <laughs> but uh but i had a camera since i was seven and it's something that i just naturally loved and you know just perspective and light and contrast and composition uh these are just things that i didn't know what i was doing when i was little and yeah. i just i bought the camera at a yard sale uh from somebody that was a wedding photographer uh that got out of the business and and just from there going forward i took four years of photography in high school I had several uh, pieces that were in traveling exhibitions and won a lot of art awards back when I was younger. Um, and then I think uh, this might happen to a lot of us. I'm not sure. It's just you graduate high school and you're like, oh, you're supposed to take life serious. You, you know, that struggle of, you, you know, you're not going to make it as an artist. You know, that fear drips in. And uh, ironically, I went into real estate at that point. And um, because my mom was in real estate at the time. Right. I did very, very well in that world. And I always kept photography. It was one of those things, no matter how far I got away from it. I, I think as artists, we like when we do our real jobs, yeah, you know, exactly. whatever that is, <laughs> like it always calls us, like our heart, like it always pulls us back to, to the art, to the thing that fulfills us. Mm -hmm. So through the years, even though I made a lot of money, did very, very well in the, in the real estate world, what happened was I would hire like mentors and pay tens of thousands of dollars to file follow people that were very accomplished photographers that had a lot of published work. I was in LA, I was in New York and, and everything. And now the, the real estate allowed me to financially be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just quietly learned and learned and learned and grew the art side of, of, of my, my world, which I have to say, like when you think, see things differently than most from your art, right. You can pull that into the business side. It gives you such different perspective than wherever the masses are. So oh, I, I've, yeah. I've always leaned into like creativity. I've always tried to bring that into the to the business side uh, as well, uh, which a lot of people don't do. They just focus on the numbers and everything, right. which I do a lot of as well. But there is a lot of art to being successful as business. But, I think um, for so many of us that are creative and have walked through a number of seasons of life, you know, for me, I was in ministry for a long time, then I had a marketing company that did really well in Atlanta, then this season of life in the last 10 years been a visual artist and now mentor to artists. It seems like, and we're the same age because I was born in 73 too. It's like, um, 73, what? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, I'm just thinking this season of my life is so fun because it's a season of convergence where everything that I love and all the life experiences that I've had, I'm able to integrate together. And it really makes for a life and really my passion now is teaching others how to do this of how to live this what I call a thriving life kind of a life where everything that you love and everything that you are is able to express and I see that in you as well because it's like you know so many times we think those seasons of our life are over or right. you know well, I'm not a photographer anymore I'm not in real estate anymore but yeah we learned so much didn't we that that makes us who we are right now yeah and I think that that's the wisdom that you're talking about earlier on is that it only it stacks through experiences yeah and it's something that we can read things in a book all day long. We can go into a class all day long. But when you actually, like for an artist, when you do the thing, you know, that's when you start getting mastery. That's when you start. And I think it's the same thing with life also. When you have these real world experiences, they kind of stack on, on each other. And then you come in with way more perspective as, as you grow. And, and I do look at life as, you know, like you said, seasons. I call them chapters, you know, right. that, that it is part of your story. Like, in, yeah. and I have no, I've had some very, very strong ups and downs uh, in my life. Even what we were talking about a, a couple minutes ago about me being in real estate, 
I did very well in that world uh, to the point, like from a business standpoint, I, I bought the one office company I worked for that we were 16 agents. And in a matter of three and a half years, I grew it to eight offices, over 200 agents, right. 16 employees, making over $8 million in commissions. So we had wow. the sales were about a half a billion a year. So I went from a very poor background to a multimillionaire lifestyle. And it all sounds great when you say it in a bubble, like right now in the 30 second, right? <laughs> Nobody and, sees any of the details. Of what I know, <laughs> it's a lot of stress. You know, a lot of us want to scale, scale, scale these days. And it's like, that comes with a lot of responsibility, a lot of stress. Sure. Uh, and opportunities, high reward, high risk. Um, but at the same time, what happened is in 2008, I got a phone call and found out in that moment of that phone call that my mother, my family member, uh, who was my inspiration getting into real estate, um, Good, better, and different. She uh, stole over six hundred thousand dollars out of my company over a period of a couple of years, wow. and my entire life in two thousand eight imploded. Like, it, like everything I worked hard for. Now, I I think a lot of us think like every decision that we make, especially in business, it's permanent, right? Like right. we're stuck in that moment in time. Like everything. And the one thing I've learned in life and business is, I there is no permanence. Like there's always an evolution. We're right. in different those different chapters. So. I lost everything. I lost my house. I lost my cars and everything. And then it was really an opportunity for me to go back to really what was truly important because I, I think I leaned on the things and the stuff because that's what everybody else tells you right. is what's going to make you happy. Right. <laughs> and, and then when you don't have any of it again, it really makes you refocus like time with my son. You know, throwing a Frisbee or football at the park costs nothing, but the depth right. of the better relationship was so incredible. And then leaning into like, okay, what can I do? And that's really where I emerged myself as a photographer, because that was something always was my escape. It's my hobby. It's what I leaned into um, to give my, my life balance and fulfillment. And then I turned it around and was able to, to monetize on it. And uh, it wasn't what I was seeking. I always wanted to keep it as a, a thing on the side. But I, I think with those seasons though, is that again, you have those experiences and you learn and then you bring that depth into the next chapter right. and it stacks on itself. Um, and that's what, you know, that journey, that part of that journey has led me to, to, to meet you and, and have these experiences uh, talking right now yeah. uh, on this podcast. You know, the funny thing I think about my journey with my baskets, my baskets for me as artistic expression was always the thing I did in the garage that nobody else knew about. You know, I had <laughs> no expectation on it. And yet that was the thing that has been really this beautiful expression and being able to monetize that and grow. It's the thing that God's used in my life in a really huge way to give me a platform to, to do what I'm doing. So I, I see so many, you know, likenesses and, and similarities in our story. I want to bring this kind of into the conversation about brand and branding, because that's one of the things that you're so passionate about. One of the things you're going to be talking about at the thriving Christian artist conference coming up in March, yeah, which so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, it's interesting for me when, when I talk about branding from a marketing perspective, it is never about, and, and marketing in general, it's never about selling your stuff, but it's always about building authentic connection with people. And I think for those people who have never gone through evolutions in their life and seasons of their life where they have something and then they lose it, or they go through a difficult struggle and they make it out on the other side, if they've not been through that, I think branding can become a hurdle because they really don't know who they are and what they're made of. And I think unless you are really comfortable with who you are in your own skin, what you're about, and then being able to share that with others, it's intensely difficult to, uh, to develop an authentic brand. Otherwise, there can be this you know, kind of imposter mentality of, well, I'm just trying to sell my stuff. And how can I get more people to, to buy my stuff? And as we all know, that doesn't work. So exactly. am I on the right, you know, are we kind yeah. of in sync with that thought? Yeah, yeah. I, I tell you, I had to live through this myself because when I lost everything, um, 2008, like I, my identity was a real estate broker and owner and I traveled around, I taught and, and taught branding, marketing, positioning to real estate agents and brokers, uh, within a very large real estate uh, corporation. And then my whole life shattered and I had to reinvent myself. And it was like, well, hold on. Like, even though I had the skill set, right. how many, how many of it, cause this is all brand and this is all marketing positioning. Like how many of us ourselves can admit that we've bought a product or service in our life that technically wasn't the best, but we had a relationship with right. who we bought it from. Right. Like, I think all of us, it could be a restaurant. It could be, you know, it could be again, a piece of artwork or something. It was the story. It was the relationship. It was the, the equity that was built 
on well, that they side. They know me. That I go back. to this restaurant because they know me. They know my order when I go there. Yeah, and you feel I'm, good because it's yeah. the whole packaging, right? Yeah. So, and and a lot of times as artists, like we focus so much that the art itself is what actually holds the value. And, and it's really tough because it's our babies and we want to love and coddle it. And it's everything that, that like, and, and I totally respect that. Um, and we think people think about our art, like we think about our art, but they oh, don't, it's a, it's a different. <laughs> it, it's interesting. The moment that it becomes a, a transaction, because when, when we do art for ourselves, it doesn't matter what anybody else's opinion is. Right. We are the judge and jury of that piece of art. And if we love it, who, who, who could critique it because it's ours. We love it. Right. And the moment that we take and we shift and we make ourselves an entrepreneur and we put that into an open market, good, better, and different. Like those, the people that are coming to us, they're making a decision, not just on art itself, but it's like, if they have $5,000 to invest or 10,000, or they have $200 to invest, like they worked for that money. They traded time, energy, effort, and their lives, they had to sacrifice it. So now when it comes to that art, it's the relationship of, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to give up this $10,000. And I believe I'm exchanging up for it. Right. Because if I felt that art was worth less, I would not exchange would that amount of money. <laughs> right. So, so that exchange that's happening. Now, what you have to understand is that there are people in your market, no matter what the market is, they didn't make that thing as good as you did. Their technique is not as good, their brush stroke, their, their habit, like whatever it is, it's not as good, but somehow, I mean, you guys know it because we all do it. Like, uh, they're getting like way more money than we are, right? <laughs> What's the deal, right? What's going <laughs> exactly. on? Exactly. And that doesn't matter what it is. It, it could, and it doesn't even have to be an art. It could be a piece of pizza. I mean, it, it's like there's somebody selling a $1 piece of pizza and like a quarter mile away, there's a different type of environment that's selling a $40 um, piece of pizza. And it all comes down to packaging and positioning and the experience that you put around it. It's the story that you put around it. And a lot of times we focus on our things so much that we forget all the peripheral that that's yeah. around it. And really that's where people see the value. It's the relationship that you have. So when they're going to pass that either 200 or that $10,000, they in their minds believe they're trading up. Right. Because otherwise they wouldn't make that exchange. So it's, it comes back to, again, and it's hard because as an artist, we always want to make it about our thing <laughs> it, it, that it, that it is. It's that, and, and I dealt with that struggle because I have to say, like, I'll give you a perfect example that I went through personally, that when I lost everything and I, I had to look into the market and as a photographer, I wanted to do artistic things, but I was going into the market. So from a business standpoint, I looked at where the money was already flowing. Because why, why try to travel upstream? Like I'm already in a bad position, lost way, everything. Right, sure. Yeah. So I, I looked into the market and that meant on an art standpoint, like I had to kind of like give up a piece of me to say, hold on, weddings is where things are at. I didn't want to shoot weddings. Headshots <laughs> is where things, are. that's like process. That's, but I can, if I take my creativity and I shift my mindset, instead of a limiting belief, like these aren't creative, I can actually right. dive into these spaces and say, this is where the market has already said they're willing to pay. So let me find my love in these spaces. Let me get creative inside of these spaces, mm. light, positioning, composition, right. other things that I can bring a part of me into it so that I can love it. And then what's interesting is when you, when you flow where that is, like people are already saying that they're willing to invest, that they're willing to exchange that hard earned money for, for that piece. And then from there, you're, you're not struggling as much because now I just have to say, okay, in the open market, I know that the money's already flowing there. Now, who's the competition? Right. And Where how am I? Right. Yeah. So how am I positioned? So normally, and maybe I'll share this at the, at the conference is there, I have a graphic that actually shows as ironic as it is, the, the number one commodity we have in our lives is water. Like there's 70% of it on the, or in the earth, right? So uh, there's these bottles of water on the slide. And on one side, it's basically like tap water. Like there's, so focus on the water as being like your art, right? right. So the, the art is what we're always focused on. Now the tap water, you can go anywhere and basically essentially get that for free if you're in a, in a first world country is, at least. Now going to the other extreme, have you ever gone into a high-end restaurant? Have you ever gone in an experience of going into a nightclub or anything? Now, I know everybody hasn't done those things, but that water gets all of a sudden, it gets packaged differently. It's put into <laughs> like a glass bottle and all of a sudden they're selling it to you for $20 or $30. And you're like, hold on, this is H2O. Like this is water, right? <laughs> Same thing, it's, different yes, values. It's, it's the marketing, it's the branding, it's positioning, it's the right. location that it's in. 
Now, what's really interesting, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but uh, there, there is a bottle of water that is sold and it's, it sells out every year and it's called uh, Nino H2O. Mm. Okay. Now they have a special edition of this bottle of water. It is called the Diamond Collection. So it's in a beautiful, and again, with the podcast, it's hard to show right. the, the detail, but inside of this bottle, uh, less than a liter, it is H2O. It is water that is inside this. Um, if I told you that they sell this bottle for $100,000 and they sell out every year and they only make 10 of them. Wow. So we have scarcity. We have urgency. That's right. We have, we have positioning right. on this bottle. This bottle has been featured on Jimmy Fallon show like this. So it, so it's H2O, right? It's H2O. <laughs> At the end of the day, right. Yes. But I tell yeah. you, it's the story, it's the positioning, it's right. the marketing and the branding because right. in every single one of those bottles and in this graphic, there's like, a, like seven different bottles that go from free all the way up to a hundred thousand dollars. And it has the same quantity in it. It has the same quality we're focused on the water of our business. A lot of times we're focused on the thing that we think is most important because that's what we're emotionally tied to Right but in the open market. It's about positioning. It's about the packaging. It's the that's story so that will totally separate you. Cause I, and I, and I know we have all experienced this. We, we see something come across the newsfeed and it's like, wow, this piece of work, this artwork sold for, you know, and then it's millions of dollars. Right. And we're looking at that thing going, I can do better than that. <laughs> Hold on. You know, but it's probably limited. It's yeah. probably, you know, it's, it's the person that did it has a story, you know, that's right. behind it. And it, it's the story that sells a lot of times. And that's hard for an artist because we want it to be just about our art. Right. But when you accept that the energy and what you're putting in and what you're bringing from yourself into your art, it is you. Yeah. That's the unique part about your art is that you're bringing yourself into it. And once you understand and accept that you are your art and you're bringing yourself into that, that it should demand more because you're not duplicated. You know, right. you're, you're nowhere else in the world. You're unique. Which and is such a big barrier, I think, for so many artists, because if they don't value themselves, if they, that's, you know, in the mentoring program, we do so much of the early work we do with people is around mindset and heart because oh, yeah. they, if they don't value themselves and they can't value the story that they're telling, which right. is ultimately what people are buying in the marketplace. I remember when the first big fancy show that I did as an artist, again, I've been making my work for years, selling it for cheapo and just, you know, no thought about that. I was moving into sculptural work and I did this beautiful piece and it was everything I could do, Paul. Now this is so funny now to think about because I sell work for thousands and thousands of dollars. It, it was everything I could do to put $200 on that price tag, you know? And a guy came up to me at the show and he had the look, you know, like he, I, he's going to buy this. You know, he's, he's circling around. He's looking at it the whole time. And he said, Matt, this is a really, special piece and i'm like oh he's gonna buy this you know thank you so much you know and and i, I really love how this da, 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 you know so he's going in i'm like he's gonna totally buy this and then he says this he said you know this is a really special show yeah he said you know people come here to buy really special things you know for their home i was like yeah he's, he's gonna buy it he's gonna buy it and then he said these words he said yeah he said you know you're pricing better than i do but he said i'm gonna be honest with you two hundred dollars doesn't really say special and he mm. walked away. Yeah. And I was like, oh, did I forget that extra zero? Did I, <laughs> you know? Because no, the marketer in me would have been, I'm sorry, that's $200 off. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the other price is on the other side. You know? <laughs> but it, it positioned in me, you know, something that was that, again, what we're talking about, that what you value is many times where you start out pricing your work and how you position. But you know, that's completely off base when it comes to developing your brand and, and putting yourself out there as an artist, that it's about building that connection. And, and when you do that, this is the thing I've found over the years, when you, when you build connection first, then it is almost never about price. I know that I price can't. is one of the lower things that people consider. And I love it when people come in the studio now and they're like, this is mad. And this, he came to our house and he built this thing for us and da, 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 da. What are they doing? They're telling the story of connection. Exactly. And it, isn't that what branding is all about is telling the story and building off of the authentic connection of, of what you're doing and how others relate to it. 
I totally agree. And I, t- I have a similar story uh, to you when, again, reinventing myself as a photographer, Yeah. Uh, but in a different context where, because it is our own limiting beliefs, I think, and, I, and none of us escape it. So it's great that you're where you're at right now and you can explain that you were at that epiphany moment. Yeah. And then even for me, uh, as a photographer, um, I was networking at different events. And one thing I learned in the real estate world is your competitors can also be your best source of referrals. Sure. So what I did is just having that hat on that I was at a networking event for wedding vendors. And what I did is I ended up becoming good friends with another wedding photographer at the time. So months and months later, uh, this gentleman, uh, Tim, who is technically a competitor of mine, he actually sends me a referral, right? So at the time I was just doing weddings. So I was like barely a thousand dollars. I didn't believe in myself yet. I was just trying to build and everything. So I was where the market was per se. But Tim, he was established and he had, he saw my work and he knew what that was. He didn't know my price point, but we built rapport and he was already booked on on a particular day. So he referred this couple over to me. So when he referred the couple over, it came across as an email and I was like, oh, and they put in the form, like they were going to be at this one particular venue. I was like, wow, I know this one venue, like the people spend money there. Yeah. And I'm a thousand dollars. So I was like, so what I did is I hit up Tim. I'm like, Tim, um, what is your starting price? And his starting price was over $3,000, right? <laughs> That's his starting price. So here's an inquiry, people that wanted him. Yeah. And he referred me. So now I have this third party referral. He believed in me as a competitor. He saw my work and he believed. So he sent the people over. I have to say, like instantly that day, I raised my prices threefold. I have a um, new normal, right? Exactly. <laughs> and those people booked me and they've been loyal clients and they, they through the years referred me a lot of business. And the thing was, it was that my own limiting belief that there was nobody, because I think we get caught up in the trap that we can't afford our own work. Right. So there's, and, the, either, right. Yeah, and the natural people that are around us that are our sphere of influence, the people that we surround ourselves with, they also are probably not our avatar. They're not our perfect client. Right. So that we, that becomes our reality. We don't think a lot of times like there's other people that exist that would see this differently. And then that when it sets our reality, then when we put stuff in the market, because like as a photographer, like everybody only wanted to give me 50 bucks and they wanted all the images type thing. Right. And it's just like, it was like, oh, you know, they're looking at Groupon all day long. It's like, oh, you know. And so it's just like I had to get out of like for years, we very rarely have ever photographed anybody that's our friends or family members. They they are friends and family members. They're not our clients. Right. They're not who we're targeting towards. So it's just the same thing. I think a lot of us are in that bubble that our marketing and branding really has been like Facebook posts, has been social media, and it's really going to our sphere, our friends and our family members. Right. And they're all going to be probably in that similar level. And we don't realize that there's maybe one or two layers up that we're not directly exposed to on a daily basis. A lot of times we don't even know these people exist. And we, we don't have to always break bread with our clients. We're not always doing that. But they will perceive our work differently, uh, just like that gentleman did with, with you. Yeah, like absolutely. he came in for something unique and special. That's normally somebody that's at an achiever level. Right. It's somebody that's worked really hard. They're typically, their income level is higher than others. They're very secure with themselves. So when they go, they actually want to buy products and services that not everybody else has. Right. And the connects with who they are, their values. And yeah, sure. Exactly. It's unique. Right. Right. So if everybody has it, and it could be anything from a pen that's in their pocket, that's why they'll spend a couple hundred or a few thousand dollars for a pen. Now, a lot of people look at that and get turned off and that's okay. You have different set of values and just right. be okay with that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that there's like tens of thousands of people that'll walk into a Walmart today to buy a $7 shirt. And then in that same town, there is probably like 15, 20, 30 women that'll walk into a white house black market today and spend $700. Yeah. There's not a right or wrong. It's just, they have different values, different branding, different positioning. And it's just like the, you potentially can sell less and cater to a different clientele. Or unfortunately, a lot of us as small business owners, like we get burned out if we try to do the Walmart method, right. you know, the Amazon Walmart, where you're trying to put a lot of things out there for very little, because those people are normally the highest maintenance people, clients Absolutely. that come to us. <laughs> yeah, I tell people all the time, you know, that and I had an artist tell me, in fact, an artist right next door to me, uh, he told me years ago, he said, Matt, you got to go to the wall, put your work on the wall. And he said, the, the larger something is and the more expensive it is, the quicker it will sell and the less 
trouble that you'll have with a client. And it is absolutely true. I've even seen that in the mentoring program as we've, as we've raised our prices a little bit, a little over the year, yeah. we get less people that cancel. We get, <laughs> we get a more engaged student because they're yeah. invested and they're not thinking about, I can't afford, you know, this little bit of money. They're thinking, no, this is what I want. Exactly. I'm going after this. And I tell artists all the time, you know, if you're constantly hitting up against those, you know, price issues and I can't afford it. And can't you just give me this that I'm in your family? It's not that you're wrong. You're just in front of the wrong people. Yep. And uh, so it automatically begs the question, which is probably a whole nother podcast. It's something I go into a lot of the mentoring program, but it's, you know, how do you get in front of those, those clients? Let's just kind of bring it to the, the branding yeah. part of that, you know, packaging and the way that you present yourself and the way that you present your story is a huge, huge part of that. Um, and let me, let me just say this. I, I mentioned this actually with Melissa talking about Instagram. One mm -hmm. of the things I learned in my branding as an artist, when I would take pictures of my art in million dollar homes and $10 million homes <laughs> after I'd installed it, subconsciously, when yeah. people looked at it, all of a sudden they thought, oh, wow, this is somebody I should follow. This is somebody that's worthy of the money that he's asking. This is somebody that's important that has a provenance and little things like that with, with branding and the messaging that you're putting out say so much more than any copy that you could ever put on your website. So for somebody that's out there thinking, well, gosh, I would love to get out of <laughs> to dealing with those Walmart customers in my art and get into that upper echelon, creating that avatar, um, what are a couple of tips, Paul, that you would say are really, really important for them? So I'll, I'll give you one tactical uh, that's very big. So you can probably get a, a couple lessons right out of it. It's what I did personally. Yeah. Is that understand that when I did very, very well in, in the real estate world, you know, I lived a multimillionaire lifestyle. So I had the big 5,000 plus square foot house. I had a Hummer. I had a Prowler. I was jet setting around the world. I also was a volunteer of several nonprofits. I was on committees. Uh, a lot of fundraising. And the one thing that I, that I knew was that, you know, when people hit a certain level of income and certain level of influence, they are bored with buying more and more things. So what they do is they give their time, they donate, they, they're in philanthropy, they give back a lot. And that's not something when you don't have any money that you think of a lot, right. but you know, when, so what I did as a photographer, uh, when I lost everything is I had to flip the script. I had to get back in front of the people, but I was on the opposite side as the artist. So, so what I did is I purposely looked in my market and said, okay, I'm not in these circles. I need to figure out where these people hang out and right. I need to be present and relevant where they're at. So one example was the nonprofits. So what I did is I looked at it and said, okay, like here's a couple of galas that people are paying anywhere between a hundred to a thousand dollars a plate to attend. So can you only imagine the type, the, the, the room of people that are in, like if there's like 400 people in that room and they all paid $500 each to be in that room, like they just raised a half million dollars uh, or you know, $250,000 before the event even began. So if you had an auction item in there, you're getting exposure in there. But what I try to do is I try to volunteer because what I want to do is I don't want to just, because everybody's going to ask you for a free auction item. Right. Very little does that really get you known. Benefits you in any way, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. What I want to do is I want, so with photography, that was volunteering on the photography end. Now, you don't have to do that. I used to volunteer, you know, on the committees and I would be in these rooms because what I want to do is I want to have the opportunity to engage in conversations with the people because there's two types of people that are in that room. It's that achiever we talked about earlier on. They have the money, they have the wealth, they have the expendable income that they see something of value that's unique. They're going to invest in it. And when you have that relationship, boom, all day long, they're a repeat client of yours forever. You know, they'll, they'll fill all their house and their homes and other things with all yeah. your art uh, based on that relationship. And that comes over time. Now, there's also a second group of people that are in that room. Those are the ones that want to be those people. <laughs> they're the ones that spend a exorbitant amount of money to keep up with the Joneses in the way. Like they are there. They're looked at as emulators. They're the ones that want to be the achiever. So they purposely pay. They might save up their money a little bit to buy that ticket to be in that room because right. they're doing 
they want to influence those people that are in that room. So you both, you win on both sides being in, inside that space. Cause now what you're doing, cause you have to understand when it comes to nonprofits, as an example, you have the fundraising side, which is the philanthropists and the people that, that are there, the donors and everything. So that's where the wealth, that's where the money is. Then you have the other side, which is whatever that nonprofit does, what they stand for, that they're helping the people that are needy and you know, the end, the end result of, of the fundraising and the efforts, right? right? So a lot of us naturally, because from our soul, we want to definitely help out on the end user end. Now, the challenge is, is when we spend a lot of time just in that space alone, then those are the people that we surround ourselves with. Unfortunately, a lot of times because they're being helped are not in a position to be able to invest at the level that we want for our art. So it's like doing both sides or coming into the space of where the people that are able to do that. Now, I would just say it's all about social cues at that point. You, right. you can't be eighth grade dance sitting in the corner. Like if you're in that room, you got yourself in that room. You, you can't be right. like, pre, you know, all the way in the corner, sitting in a chair, pretending like um, you're just waiting for the time to go by to say that you were there. Like you have to get in and you have to look Engage at things. as like right? <laughs> yeah, It's engaging. And it's also, yeah. you have to be good with social cues because you can't go up and sell to these people, you know? So this is a long-term relationship. I have to say that's where I rebuilt my life going from zero, like over $3 million in debt when I lost my real estate company, being homeless, living in, in, a, in a car for a couple of weeks. And then I was able to crash on my buddy's couch for several months. And nobody externally knew those things that were going on because um, I didn't project it, but I was struggling in a big way. But what I did is I put myself in the right rooms of people that I knew that could afford that would invest in things like I was offering. So, and by doing that, what happens is today it was just me like taking a picture or just saying hi and introducing myself and getting to know, but no pitch, no, like no exchanging a business card unless it was asked for. Right. Cause it was then three months from now, I'd be at a similar event. The same people show up. It's like, Hey, weren't you at the last one? And yeah. that's the, and so it's, this is a natural progression of a relationship. But what it is, is like two years later, the CTO of JP Morgan uh, Chase Bank is running across the room. Diane, she's hugging me, asking me how <laughs> David's doing. Like, what's, look, we're best friends. And you know what? This is the person that everybody in the room wants to get to. That's right. They're the one that's up doing the keynote uh, presentation. So and now she, all of a sudden, Paul husband, is important. <laughs> exactly. Paul is worth talking to or whatever. Yeah, yeah. sure. So what, what you're doing is, I call it status stacking, is what you're doing is you go from nobody to now – you put yourself around a circle of, of people that in a controlled environment that now others on the outside of that right. look at you differently. They see your work differently because now you packaged yourself, you positioned yourself. You're now looked at, you know, you're not invisible anymore. Right. You're now around a certain, now there's some event, I'm very open. There's some events that we go to when we walk in, we're like, these are not our people. <laughs> I yeah. can't hang out with these people. Like they're just talking down on everything. It's like, eh. Okay, well, just not well, a fit, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a different pond of people. So go find another one. You know, I, and, yeah, I so resonate with this. I teach this concept in the mentoring program and I call it intersection points. You know, that you're yeah. look, well, after you create that avatar, who it is that, that's going to buy your work and, you know, that you've sold to, that you're making authentic connection with, then where can you intersect them? And I think for every artist listening, it's so important, you know, for you, it's been nonprofits. For me, it's been uh, garden clubs. Oh, you know, wow, I've, yeah. I figured out that that mostly women who buy my work, uh, you know, high net worth individuals, they love nature. Obviously, I do woven sculpture, you know, so yeah. I started getting invited to go speak at these garden clubs and I would sell after speaking to them for 45 minutes and I'd have lunch with them and then they're bringing their friends to the studio and you're a friend. You're not a, a salesperson right. or, or a vendor or whatever. I'm getting invited to parties now and that sort of thing. And it came out. A relationship. So the key is, I think, the takeaway for everybody is, what is it that God's given you to do artistically? Where is that uh, authentic connection point that begins yeah. to happen, and how can you begin to develop, you know, relationship and inroads into that over time? And you know, I'll be honest, Paul. This is one of the things I think that that I do. If if I'm praying about anything in my business, yeah. I never pray for money. I never pray for more ideas. I'm always praying for relationships. Oh, yes. God, would you open up an opportunity or a door <laughs> with, with to get me to the next place that I believe I'm supposed to be? And inevitably, inevitably, somebody will walk through the door or two weeks later, I'll meet somebody. And it's like the president of the bank or whatever that you said. It's somebody that you should have never been in front of, yeah. never in a million years would 
have had a normal social relationship with, and all of a sudden, boom, there's an open door. And I just love that. I call it our, the unfair advantage, right? <laughs> I mean, I just, oh, yeah. Well, and, it's, and it's very meta, but let's think about it. Like, we are doing this podcast right now because both of us independently in our own worlds that would have never crossed. That's right. We've invested ourselves in our own businesses right. that allowed us to become part of a networking group. And if, if either of us did not make that investment, we would have not have naturally developed a relationship. That's right. We would have hung out and become friends that would have naturally like saw this opportunity would have not have been created. And then like, where does this ripple end? You know what I mean? Like if we fast forward five years or 10 years from now, could this ripple be something that n neither of us could have ever imagined That's right. in different, in different ways. Like I don't, you could have somebody on your podcast right now that just resonated maybe with one piece of what I said. And that could be a new ripple that was affected because of a decision that we made a couple of years ago. That's right. Like it just, we, we can't imagine like where, where any of these decisions will carry us. What I will say is when you stay stagnant, when you decide to be that person that's in the corner, when you, when you don't get off the bench, you never have a chance to swing at the ball. That's right. So a lot of us are afraid to swing. So we just stay on the bench our entire lives. And then life just passes us by. Yeah. And it's just something like just to have the opportunity just for a moment in time to get out of our comfort zone. Even if we labeled ourselves as an introvert, well, I tell you what, some of the most successful people that I know in my life, they are self-proclaimed introverts as well, mm. but they're very, very successful because they don't allow that label to indefinitely define their decisions right. that's going to control their life. Right. So you can, at any point in time, make a different decision. And it is relationships. And I'm so glad you said that as well, because we, we, we coach, and Melissa and I coach uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs as well in a different context. And it's like, when they come in, they're only focused on the money. I'm right. like, oh, this is like a bottle rocket. This is going to like, they're going <laughs> to, even if they do well, they're going to flare up and they're going to pop and then they're going to disappear. That's it, right. How many of us know in our lives that we've had friends, family members, like they got into a new business venture, all of a sudden they get very, very aggressive. They just treat every, everybody was their friend. And then all of a sudden everybody's a number to them. Right, right. And then um, a month later, six months later, like you don't hear them talking about their thing anymore. It's because they burn <laughs> through, they burn through their relationships. Right, right. Instead of nurturing. Yeah. And I think that's something we definitely have to come back to these days is we allow the social media element, the scaling and the online thing. And what's the perfect Facebook post type thing that we forgot that maybe picking up the phone or maybe meeting each other in person, like the depth of our relationship, I think grew instantly, even though we do these on um, like online face to faces, it grew instantly. The moment that we met each other face to face, like how, how often do we skip these opportunities anymore? Exactly. And I just think, I think we need to all circle back because we've allowed these multi-billion dollar companies that are making money on us thinking in front of a screen. Um, that's why they need to come to live events. Yeah. You know, like that's a live events would change things for us. And even what, what you're doing with the community and the live events, I you just, I, I think people just don't realize a huge value it is. And I think a lot of us as artists, I had to say on my end, you know, when I was building you know, as a photographer, yeah, for a moment we're in front of people and then most of our lives are retouching and editing images in front of a screen. I think it's very lonely. It's very depressing. And I think as, as human beings, we, we, we want that social interaction. Like we're tribal and it's just something that we, we want, we feed on seeing a smile, having an engaging conversation with people that we relate to. And uh, I think definitely your conference, which I'm really excited to, to come to is, um, you know, that's the perfect opportunity where kind of like everybody gets it. You know? Absolutely. We were just talking in the team the other day about how when you look at, at people's lives in the mentoring program, outside of the program, that end up coming to a live event like the Thriving Christian Artists Conference, it is amazing almost instantaneously the things that begin to launch or the breakthrough that begins to happen in their life or the lifelong connections that, that get built with somebody just that they quote unquote by chance met, you know, ended up sitting next to at a conference. And um, I'm so excited you and Melissa are going to be there and be going a lot deeper dive into the oh, things yeah. that, that we're talking about today and also getting to know each, uh, you know, the folks that will be there at the conference, you know, just to, oh, yeah. to hang out and that sort of thing. So it's going to be really, really great. If you're listening to the podcast right now, you're like, I don't know about this. What is it? Well, you've been under a rock, but don't worry. We still love you. <laughs> go to the, go to the notes that are uh, right here in the podcast and you can uh, register for the thriving Christian artist conference. It will sell out. And um, it's amazing. We've been seeing the pre-registrations just, just flying in, but it's going to be a great, great weekend. 
Paul, I know folks are going to want to connect with you on social, on your website, wherever. So where's the best place that they can connect with you? Uh, on on the, all the social media channels, similar to Melissa, it's uh, Real Paul Pruitt. And they'll, they'll be able to find me in the, on any of those channels. And that to say is when you come to the live conference, it's one thing that Melissa and I are very big on is that we're very, very approachable. We don't put false walls up or anything. So it's just something that uh, that opportunity we're, we're looking to not only um, have the opportunity to speak, but we're going to be fully immersed as an attendee on both sides of that those moments for us. So uh, we love to, to chat and, and grow with everybody else that's in the room uh, as well. And I will say, because you're an awesome photographer, you do take the best selfies of any other speaker that's there. So. <laughs> well, hey, Paul, thanks so much for being on today. And guys, definitely check Paul out uh, all over social and make plans now to, to meet he and Melissa at the Thriving Christian Artist Podcast. Paul, thanks so much for being on. Thank you again. Hey, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with me today on the podcast. Listen, I hope it's been a huge encouragement to you on your journey as an artist. Hey, also, before you leave, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the other episodes of the Thriving Christian Artist Podcast. And also, be sure to connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, or at my website, which is matttommymentoring.com. Until next time, remember, you were created to thrive. Bye-bye.